Coming up on our newscast, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew responds strongly to bribery allegations, saying he is willing to bet his life on his innocence. Pressing the pause button on territorial and historical disputes, Korea and Japan hold high-level security talks for the first time in five years. A recent stock market rally has fattened the wallets of many Koreans, reaping the biggest gains were 24 Korean tempos. These and more coming up next. It's 10 p.m. on a Tuesday here in Korea. Welcome to Primetime News. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Hwang Jie. Thanks for joining us. Once again, our starting point is the bribery list scandal that's shaking Korea's political landscape to its core. On Tuesday, Prime Minister Lee Wan Gu faced another round of allegations. A local newspaper reported additional details from an interview with businessman Song Wan Jung that took place before his apparent suicide last week. Song told the paper that he gave E political funds two years ago. Che Yusan reports on the Prime Minister's response. Prime Minister Lee Wan Gu says he will be the first to be questioned by prosecutors over allegations he received bribes from Song Wan Jung, a former lawmaker and head of Gyeongnam Enterprises. If there's evidence of me receiving bribery from him, I should step down. But it's not true. He also denied reports published in a local daily, the Gyeongyang Shinmun, in which Sung claimed he delivered 30 million won, or some 27,000 U.S. dollars, to E before by-elections in April of 2013. Sung was found dead last Thursday, carrying a list naming eight current and former politicians, along with amounts of money. The prime minister was on the list, as well as the president's chief of staff, Yi byung but no specific amount was written beside their names. As investigators dig into Sung's suspicious money exchanges, Yi may become the country's first prime minister to be questioned by prosecutors. They're also looking into claims that Sung kept a secret ledger of the bribes. President Buck on Sunday called for the prosecution to conduct an impartial probe according to law and principles. Asked about the Kyonghyang report, President Buck's spokesperson said there's nothing the presidential office can say and that it's time to wait for the outcome of the prosecution's investigation. Ruling party floor leader Yu Seung Min said his party's Supreme Council agreed the prosecution should start questioning the prime minister. Opposition party leader Moon Jae-in, meanwhile, called on both the prime minister and the presidential chief of staff to voluntarily step down and submit to prosecutor questioning. Choi yoo Arirang News. Song Wan Jung, who was once the CEO of Gyeongnam Enterprises Company, is at the center of bribery scandal. It will be delisted from the benchmark Cosby on Wednesday. Yes, that's uh, once a power player in the construction industry. The company's stock trading was suspended last month after years of continuous losses. Shin Semin tells us more. It has been 42 years since Gyeongnam Enterprises went public, making it the first Korean construction company on the country's stock exchange. But that legacy stops this Wednesday, as the company will be delisted from the market due to mounting debts. A slump in the local housing market helped to put the cash-strapped company in the red in recent years, posting some 280 million U.S. dollars worth of losses in 2013, and over 370 million the following year. The construction company had been going through a corporate debt workout program for some time, but its stock was in the process of being terminated after creditors rejected the company's request for additional financial support last month. The company also failed an attempt to go into court receivership. During its heyday in the 1990s, Gyeongnam stock peaked at $205. On Tuesday, the company's last day on the exchange, stocks were traded at just 10 U.S. cents, plunging nearly 45 percent from the day before. Although Gyeongnam is leaving the market, it was the first local construction company to develop its business in overseas markets in 1965. The builder began international work in Thailand, then expanded to Sri Lanka, 
Cameroon, Malaysia, and even to the Middle East in the 1970s. Gangnam Enterprises is now at the heart of a political scandal as its late chairman Song Wan Jung committed suicide while facing investigation for pocketing overseas resource investment funds during former President Lee Myung Bak's administration. A note found on his body named eight prominent politicians and listed amounts of money, allegedly bribes. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And over at the National Assembly, continuing controversy over the bribery list scandal has dominated Tuesday's interpolation ses session. Our Park ji tells us more. Korea's foreign unification and defense ministers, as well as Prime Minister Lee wan gu all attended the second day of interpolation sessions on diplomatic and security issues. However, a large portion of the session has been directed at grilling Prime Minister Lee over the bribery allegations. How can prosecutors independently investigate heavyweight figures like Prime Minister and the presidential chiefs of staff? Aren't they the ones making personal decisions about prosecutors? Thus, the introduction of special prosecution is mandatory. I agree that the investigation should be thorough, and if Parliament approves a special prosecution, I will accept the investigation. The Prime Minister even said during the session that he would put his life on the line if there's evidence of bribery allegations. Besides the time spent on the bribery scandal, the session covered a wide range of security, diplomatic and inter-Korean issues. Regarding the controversial possible deployment of the U.S.'s anti-ballistic missile system, known as the THAAD, Defense Minister Han Mingu said it is one of the options to counter North Korean threats, adding that Korea is developing its own missile shield called the Korean Air and Missile Defense. Eradicating corruption in the nation's defense procurement system was also discussed. Despite the government's numerous efforts to root out corruption in the nation's defense industry, why are corruption cases so rampant in this area? Due to special features of defense projects, many of them proceed in secret, and most contracts between the military and defense businesses are carried out in bilateral monopoly, leaving plenty of room for corruption. The Assembly's interpolation sessions will continue until Thursday, moving on to focus on the economy, education and social and cultural matters. Park ji Arirang News. Now shifting gears, North Korea's waning economy has shown no signs of improvement, but the regime continues to spend big on defense. Seoul's defense ministry estimates Pyongyang spent about 10.2 billion U.S. dollars on its military last year, marking a 16 percent increase in five years. The figure is based on purchasing power parity terms calculated by the state-run Korea Institute for Defense Analyses, as the regime does not publicly reveal its exact defense budget. North Korea's gross national income stood just under $31 billion last year, with its military budget taking up one-third of the amount. Back at Korea's National Assembly, Parliament has adopted a resolution on Tuesday condemning Japan for its repeated claims over Korea's Tokyo Island and its attempts to distort history. Our Chim Young Gil explains. The parliamentary resolution that passed at Tuesday's plenary session denounced Tokyo's recent approval of more Japanese school textbooks containing claims to the Korea controlled Tokyo Island. The Korean people, the National Assembly and the Foreign Ministry need to work together in order to foster a systematic approach to counter Japan's provocations over Korea's Tokyo Island and distorting history. The resolution urged the Japanese government to withdraw its approval of all textbooks that say Tokyo Island belongs to Japan, calling the books a clear violation of Korea's territorial sovereignty. The resolution raised concerns that the distorted and fabricated history textbooks will cause strife between future generations in Korea and Japan. The assembly also expressed regret over Japan's double standard attitude. Tokyo had said it would work with Seoul to mark the 50th anniversary of diplomatic normalization between the two countries. However, recent events, such as the textbook approvals, indicate an unwillingness to recognize history and Korean sovereignty.
The resolution also warned that already frayed relations between Seoul and Tokyo will be further impaired by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's continued visits to the Yasukuni War Shrine and Japan's refusal to take responsibility for the sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. Kim young Arirang News. Just as important as issuing harsh words to Japan, it is also important to stay reachable and maintain lines of communication with that country. And that is why senior officials from Korea and Japan met for a round of defense talks in Seoul on this Tuesday. The meeting, which is the first since late 2009, focused on Japan's moves to revise its security laws. Our Hwang Sung-hee reports. The so-called 2 plus 2 meeting held in Seoul on Tuesday was the first high-level security talks between Korea and Japan in more than five years. The near three-hour meeting involved two defense and foreign ministry officials from the two sides. Korea asked Japan to refrain from raising concerns of neighboring countries by maintaining transparency in the process of modifying its security laws and revising its defense guidelines with the United States. They stress Tokyo must seek Seoul's consent before pushing ahead with any matter that involves security on the Korean peninsula. To that, Japan said it will remain transparent with its activities and respect Korea's sovereignty. A senior official at Seoul's foreign ministry said Tokyo also suggested holding a meeting between their defense ministers as soon as possible, to which Korea said the issue will be taken under review. The security talks between the two neighbors were suspended since late 2009 due to strained bilateral relations over historical and territorial issues. It's also the first in a series of similar talks to be held later this week. Vice foreign ministers from the two sides will meet with their U.S. counterpart in Washington on Thursday, which will be followed by a trilateral high-level security dialogue. Hwang Sung-hee, Arirang News. An Asiana airplane that was making a landing at Japan's Hiroshima airport skidded off the runway this Tuesday evening, leaving 23 people injured. Japanese media reported that the incident happened at around 8 p.m., which departed Incheon. Everyone aboard has managed to evacuate the plane. Now, the South Korean embassy in Libya is temporarily moving operations after it was attacked by armed gunmen last Sunday. With the decision, two Korean diplomats and one embassy staffer have been flown out of Tripoli to Tunisia. There, the Korean government plans to assess the safety of some 30 Koreans still in Libya. And armed shooters fired more than 40 machine gun rounds at the embassy, killing two local police officers and injuring one other. A group claiming to be the Tripoli branch of the Islamic State militant group claimed responsibility for the attack. President Bok says she hopes to increase cooperation with Hungary in persuading North Korea to change and choose a path toward development. Meeting with visiting Hungarian President Yanush Adher on Tuesday, she said the North should realize it cannot develop with nuclear weapons and should take note of Hungary's successes once it shook off communism. The two leaders also agreed to merge Hungary's advanced science and technology with Korea's manufacturing and production technologies to pursue innovation in IT, auto parts and biopharmaceutical industries. Welcoming the visiting Ethiopian president, President Bak discussed a two sides initiative to build a joint textile and apparel complex in the African country. And the government is stepping up safety checks in response to calls for a tighter inspection and handling of entertainment facilities, which have been prone to man-made disasters as of late. Our cultural correspondent Kim ji yeon has more. Safety first. That sentiment has gripped the nation after a series of shocking disasters over the past year. A family of five, including three children, died at a camping site last month when their tent caught on fire. Sixteen people fell to their deaths while watching an outdoor concert on top of a ventilation grate that collapsed, dropping them 25 meters. And of course, the tragic Cerro Ferry incident that killed more than 300 people, mostly high school students. Many believe that systematic safety checks could have decreased or prevented the severity of these tragedies. Now the government is starting to take a proactive approach to disaster prevention. 
The culture minister is inspecting the safety standards of entertainment facilities, like this camping site, ahead of the first public safety day to be marked on Thursday. Currently, there are an estimated 1,900 outdoor camping facilities in Korea, with more opening and the numbers are growing rapidly. Some are even equipped with refrigerators and heating systems, but many of them lack adequate safety equipment such as fire extinguishers and hoses due to their unconventional settings. The cultural minister Kim Jong-dok says that's going to change. Outdoor facilities will be subject to periodic safety inspections and the Tourism Promotion Act, which took effect last January. If these measures are not met by next February, those responsible could be held up to two years behind bars or fined about 18,300 U.S. dollars. Kim says his ministry will conduct a nationwide safety inspection of outdoor facilities by the end of the month. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. We move our viewpoint to space, the final frontier. Korea's Arirang 3A satellite is successfully sending footage from space. On Tuesday, the science ministry released several clearer photos taken from the satellite at different points in its orbit. The photos include images of Seoul and Baekdosan Mountain in North Korea. The satellite's infrared camera is capable of taking photos at any given time. The Arirang 3A will be in orbit for four and a half years and its tasks include monitoring the environment and analyzing climate change. Korea's sluggish pace of recovery is casting a cloud over previous growth predictions. The LG Economic Research Institute forecasts Korea to grow 3 percent this year, down 0.4 percentage points from its previous outlook. The think tank attributes the downward revision to slowing exports and weak domestic consumption. The Bank of Korea has also revised its growth projection for this year to 2 3.1 percent, down from an earlier 3.4 percent forecast. Foreign investment banks like Nomura and BNP Paribas have already lowered their growth forecasts to below 3 percent. Now, the Korean stock market hit a high not seen in nearly four years today on the back of steady inflows of foreign capital and expectations for positive corporate first quarter earnings. Well, how much is too much? Well, this bull run has also boosted the value of Korea's stock rich. Our Kim Min-ji reports. The benchmark Kospi rose 0.61 percent on Tuesday to close over 2,100 points, the highest level since August of 2011. Market capitalization also hit a new record at about 1.2 billion U.S. dollars. The rally comes on the back of ample global liquidity from quantitative easing in Europe and foreign buying. Appetite for Korean shares are also higher compared to other emerging countries, along with expectations that local companies post better first quarter results. In Tuesday's trading alone, foreigners bought a net $360 million worth of shares, remaining as net buyers for nearly a week. The recent rally is also putting smiles on the nation's biggest stockholders. According to local conglomerate tracker Tebel.com, 24 Koreans hold more than 1 trillion won, or roughly $910 million in stock assets. Among the big winners is the owner of cosmetics giant Amore Pacific, Sa kyung -bae. His shares jumped more than 50 percent since the start of the year to roughly $8.5 billion as of Tuesday. Merit's financial group chairman Jo Jung Ho also saw his equities grow over 40 percent in the same period, while Chung Mong Jun, the largest stakeholder of Hyundai Heavy Industries, saw about a 30 percent gain. Analysts say there is room for even more growth on Seoul's bourse in the short term, especially as China is expected to take further stimulus measures in light of its slowed economic growth. Kim Min Ji, Arirang News. It's time to take a look at the leading headlines from around the world with Paul E. And our focus today, Nigeria marks the first anniversary since the kidnapping of over 200 schoolgirls, tensionese in crisis-stricken Ukraine, and a piece of World War II goes under the hammer. 
That's right. And Paul, let's start off in Nigeria. It's been a year since the shocking mass abduction sparked international outrage. Has there been any hope in finding these young girls? Well, despite teams of American and British experts aiding in this search, none of the victims have been found yet. Nigerian president-elect Muhammadu Buhari said there hasn't been any sign of them since last May, but vowed the government would do everything to bring them home. On Monday, a silent protest was held in the capital, Abuja, to raise awareness of the Chibok students, many of whom were as young as 16 years old when they were taken by Boko Haram militants. Organized by the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, the demonstrators said they were still hanging on to hope. You know, the time starts. You are in pain that you don't even, to the extent that you don't say a word. People talk to you, you have no answers for them. So for us, we have reached this moment where tomorrow is going to be one year. And it's so painful that sadly we might wake up tomorrow and our girls are still not back. We have talked and talked and talked and talked for 364 days today. So we feel it's time to just go silent and express our pain by, by, by being quiet. A new report by Amnesty International says at least 2,000 women and girls have been abducted by Boko Haram. Based on nearly 200 witness accounts, many of the victims have been forced into sexual slavery and trained to fight for the Islamist militant group. Boko Haram is regarded as the worst threat to the future of Nigeria, which represents Africa's biggest economy. And turning now to the conflict in Ukraine, four-way international talks have paved the way for an extended ceasefire in the east of the country between government forces and pro-Russian rebels. An agreement was reached Monday after a meeting in Berlin with the foreign ministers of Germany, France, Ukraine and Russia. German Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier said a deal was also reached to resume prisoner exchanges which have been stalled since February. He said the talks clearly showed once again how far apart Kiev and Moscow remain on resolving the crisis. In light of the worsening situation, we agreed today not only to continue with the withdrawal of heavy weapons, but also to include other categories of weapons in the withdrawal. Now tanks, armored vehicles, mortars and heavy weapons below a 100 millimeter caliber will be included in the withdrawal commitment. However, the fragile ceasefire is already being tested. Six Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the last 24 hours in the separatist-held territories, allegedly by heavy weapons. Meanwhile, the International Committee of the Red Cross is distributing food and medicine to those living near the frontline areas. The agency said displaced residents on both sides were at risk of collateral damage. And finally, a rare notebook belonging to the Nazi codebreaker Alan Turing has been sold at auction for more than one million U.S. dollars. Von Hamm's auction house said the 52-page manuscript was sold on Monday in New York. It contains Turing's handwritten notes when he led a British team of scientists during World War II to crack the infamous Enigma code used by the German military. Their work is credited for helping to bring the war to a close and thus saving countless lives. Turing is considered the father of modern computing and artificial intelligence, and experts say the result of this latest auction is a testament to that legacy. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Well, dramatic changes in the weather are being felt nationwide this week. Even a heavy snow advisory was issued for the mountainous regions of Kaundu province this afternoon for about a couple of hours. And now most of the rain clouds that dropped scattered showers throughout the day have moved out. And temperatures were also on the chilly side all day long. Northern regions and southern provinces had a cool and breezy day today. But the peninsula is about to enjoy a balmy spring spring day under partly to mostly sunny skies. So on that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for tomorrow. Seoul and Busan will peak at 19, while Daegu and Gwangju will rise to 22 and 21 respectively. And as for the other regions, it looks like Daejeon and Jeju will see a high of 20 and 19, while Dokdo rises to 12. Now it seems like another round of light rain is in the forecast for Thursday afternoon and Sunday looks to be a rainy one as well. Well, well, that's all for Korea, and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
And that brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for staying with us. This has been Hwang Ji-hae. And I'm Daniel Che. Join us same time tomorrow. Goodbye for now.